Welcome back to Battleship Systems. The Synchro, Selzin, Autosyn, Telemotor, Teletorque, whatever you want to call them, help create some of the most advanced weapons in World War II. The idea of being able to accurately transmit positions electrically was a game changer for fire control and ships operations. In this episode, we look at how synchros work and some of the ways they're used in battleships. Please check the errata page in the description. When you hear the term interior communication, most people think about verbal messages. And as we've seen in the previous episodes, that's certainly one way to communicate. A lot of times this can be slow or words can be blighted by the sound of battle. Of course, battleships have bells and lights to alert the crew of certain conditions. But what about indications that require a lot of accuracy and are constantly changing? A synchro is used to communicate in an entirely different way. It looks like a motor, but instead of spinning, the shaft mimics the position of another synchro. To understand how it operates, it helps to understand how DC motors and transformers work since they incorporate aspects of both. If you remember back to the episode on DC motors, we can induce a magnetic field in the rotor to make it spin. Consider if we have a fixed magnet mounted to a shaft and three coils on a stator with all their ends connected together. By applying power in different arrangements, we can rotate the magnet to about six different positions. The magnet is either opposed or attracted to the stator coils. By leaving one coil disconnected, we gain another six positions. In theory, by varying the voltages to the individual coils, we can attain any position we want. The problem is, how do you do that? Well, you don't. And before synchros, you had to design your systems to compensate for these limited positions. Usually this involves gearing it down to slow down the movement of the dial. But then the problem is you would have no way of knowing if one dial becomes out of sync. Synchros don't use permanent magnets. They rely on transformer action to move the rotor. If you remember back to the episode we did on transformers, if we have a looped core with two coils on either side, by sending alternating current through one coil, we will induce a current in the other coil. This isn't magic. One coil transforms energy into a changing magnetic field, and the other coil changes it back. Now consider what would happen if we don't have a core, but just hold them next to each other. We still get mutual induction. Let's get another two coils and wire one to our AC line and the other to the other coil. To understand what happens, take a look at the AC waveform. When the voltage is positive, the magnetic field produced is the same for both primary coils. So the voltage induced in this separate circuit will inherently cause the coils to produce a field that carries on their induced field. This also holds true when the voltage is negative and the coils will always be attracted to each other. Let's try reversing this other coil. Now the other coils are generating voltages in opposite directions. Since the voltages cancel each other out, there can be no current, and hence no magnetic field. Let's try something else. We'll mount a primary coil on a rotor and then mount three secondary coils on the stator so they're 120 degrees apart. We'll then connect the coils in a Y configuration. Let's duplicate this and connect them together as shown. And here you have your basic synchro system. No matter where you turn the rotor, its changing magnetic field affects all the stators. Their induced voltages are sent to the other synchro. If that other rotor is not in the exact same position, a current will flow through the stator coils. Every time the voltage cycles, they will generate an electromotive force to pull the rotors to the same position. This makes synchros self-synchronizing and indefinitely accurate. Battleships have hundreds of these devices for systems such as maneuvering, engineering, radars, searchlights, and perhaps most importantly, fire control. To standardize these devices, the Bureau of Ordnance developed their own specifications for the standard Navy synchro. Each type was given a mod number, which determines the manufacturer and a letter for any modifications. The mark specifies which Navy standard design was used. And there is a type or designation for the unit. 
For example, a Mark III is the third standard design. Mod 3 means it's made by the Ford Instrument Company, and Type 7G means that it's a size 7 synchro generator. In general, the larger the synchro, the more accurate it is. Synchro motors have a tendency to take off when first started. That's why they have a built-in inertia damper that kicks in when the rotor starts to oscillate. The only difference between a synchro motor and a generator is that a generator does not have this damper. Here's a synchro motor made by the Arma Corporation. It's a Mark 8 Mod 1B, meaning it's Arma's second revision, and Type 1F. The Type 1 is the smallest type of synchro, and F means that it's supposed to be flange mounted. And since there's only one right way to wire a synchro, the connections are clearly labeled on the back. R1 and R2 are for the rotor's power, and S1, 2, and 3 are the stator connections. Now for the generator. This one is made by the Control Instrument Company. That makes it a Mod 5, and the type is 6G, meaning that it's a size 6 synchro generator. In fact, the 6G is one of the synchros used in the Mark 8 range keepers to control the battleship's 16 inch guns. Let's light them up and see if they still work. Here we go. Now you hear that clank? That's the rotor hitting the inertia damper as it's forced into place. But as you can see, as I turn the generator, the motor follows the action. I can even turn the motor and have it turn the generator. Now if I try to move these apart from each other, it's real anger with me. Let's take some voltage and amperage reading. Now since I can't access where all the stators are connected, we'll have to take the voltages between the stators. Let's start with S1 and S2. See, as the rotor changes positions, the voltage starts to rise as it gets closer to the stator. and falls as it gets further away. Now just for fun, let's look at the amps the S1 wire is carrying. So as long as the rotors stay in sync, there's barely any amps going through there. At the most like 0.05. But the second I push them out of sync, the amps shoot up. With this system, ships no longer need to build long shafts or chains to carry orders. As long as you have alternating current, you can carry orders through these five wires to any part of the ship. Despite popular belief, the Imperial Japanese Navy had them too. They were never top secret devices. It's just that they didn't know how to use them like we did. Here I have a 16 inch turret mounted to a synchro motor. I can control it remotely using the generator. Now I can also have my director generating that train order. As the director follows the target, so do the turrets. Since it's just an electrical signal, I can switch it to a different turret. or both turrets. Now that switch I did just there is something the Japanese could never do. Their battleships had no concept of cutting out action from damaged parts of the ship or redirecting synchro signals with the flip of a switch. Now obviously a synchro can't move a 2,000 ton turret but the training gear can. And if you have one dial for requested and another for actual rotation, you can remove the need for verbal orders. Gunner's mates are no longer responsible for aiming and instead they get to play a game called follow the pointer. Let's say that this worm gear in outer dial is directly linked to our turret's rotation. And this inner dial is our train orders. All we have to do is keep the crosshairs matched by moving our training hand wheels. 
we don't even need to know the actual degrees of train. And if it's moving too fast, we can release your firing trigger until you're matched up again. There's another type of pointer matching technique that only uses one dial. So instead of matching an outer dial, our entire synchro moves with the turret or whatever it is that we're moving. The goal is then to keep the crosshairs pointed to the index mark. This type of system is called the zero reader. Most power drive indicators use a combination of the previous matching techniques. The concept of follow-up is something used all throughout fire control. The idea of something big and strong following something small and weak. One thing the Japanese definitely didn't have was fully automatic control of the turrets. A system that compares the response with the order and uses the difference to drive a correction is called a servo. Let me know in the comment section below if you want me to build a servo system and also what are some things in real life that you think act like a synchro? By the way, don't forget to like and subscribe. We'll talk more about automatic control systems when we go over receiver regulators, but a fundamental component of these systems is called a synchro control transformer. This is a control transformer made by Magnavox in the late 50s. It's fundamentally the same as a synchro motor, except it's used in the opposite way. Instead of sending power through the rotor, we use it to measure the voltage in phase polarity to determine how far off the shaft is from synchronization. Since the shaft is connected to whatever it is that we're moving, we can use this signal to drive a motor or something that has the ability to move the heavy load. As you can see, this little dial doesn't give us much accuracy. And we need accuracy when firing at something thousands of yards away. In order to get more accuracy out of a synchro system, we can use one set for high speed and another for low speed. For example, the train orders for the 16-inch turrets come over a 1-speed and a 36-speed synchro. There's no difference between a 1-speed and a 36-speed synchro, it's just how they're geared on the generator end. The idea is that for every 10 degrees of the 360-degree dial, the 36-speed will spin a full revolution. And if our response dials are geared the same way, we can increase our accuracy tenfold. I get the impression the Navy went on a synchro buying frenzy in the 50s and 60s. You can find them all over the internet, and I almost guarantee every single one of them still works. For my setup, I'm using regular 115 volts AC for excitation, and run it to all the rotors in parallel. It's important that all the rotors use the exact same power source, otherwise they'll never synchronize. In lieu of donations to me, please consider donating to a battleship museum like the Battleship Missouri. There's a link in the description that'll bring you to the USS Missouri Memorial Association website where you can donate to the nonprofit organization. Thanks for watching.